Okay. So first I'm going to talk about cultivars themselves. Then we'll talk about a particular bunch of cultivars called paramounts. And then I'm going to talk a little about uh, what I'm doing with, uh, with the paramounts and that with further hybridizing. Or what I have been doing, I'm no longer doing it. Now I'm just a retired old guy. So anyhow, cultivars, what are they? Well, cultivar names are given to any worthwhile plants or special hybrids for reference. So if you have a plant that's a special in, in appearance or in the flower or anything, you can give it a cultivar name and that name applies to just that one plant. Okay, so this is something beyond species. So normally when you, um, when you show the name of the plant then, you either write the cultivar name in quotes or follow or precede it with CV dot, meaning of course cultivar. Okay, now a lot of people think that cultivar names are only given to hybrids. That's not correct. Any plant, like if you grow a bunch of seeds and you have a freak show up amongst those seedlings, you can give that freak a cultivar name, even though it's not a hybrid. But again, that cultivar name is only applied to that one freak. <laughs> and a cultivar name should only be written with an initial capital and the remaining of the letters in lowercase. Now, a lot of people don't follow these rules, but these are the rules for it. So because a cultivar is a specific clone, it cannot be propagated from seed. So if you're looking at seed lists and there's a bunch of cultivars listed, you're being scammed <laughs> because they're not those cultivars can only be propagated vegetatively. So that means you're taking cuttings or offsets or doing um, vegetative hydroponic type uh, growing to, to cultivate the things. Now, seedlings grown from the fruit of a cultivar, in other words, if you get seeds on a cultivar, and you grow plants from that, you must not give them the same cultivar name. If they also are worthwhile cultivars, you have to give them different cultivar names because they are different clones. So that leads me to this last point. If, if in your collection you have Astrophyta mysterious cultivar super kabuto, you don't. It's incorrectly named because there is only one super kabuto, and I don't believe there are any vegetative offsets or, uh, or um, clones from that that are in, uh, <laughs> would be in the trade. So what you would have are offspring of super kabuto. So you could say, super kabuto type, but you can't use CV or call it cultivar super kabuto, okay? And this, this happens a lot. People will take seeds from a, from a true cultivar and spread them around with the name of that cultivar. And of course, they, they can't be that because they're going to be different clones. Okay, now closely related genera will easily hybridize. So if we talk about the Echinopsis genus, so now this is cacti, the, the cultivar thing was any plant that applied to any plant. So now in cacti, 
the Echinopsis genus will easily hybridize. So we have the clo all closely related genera, Echinopsis, Libivia, Helianthocereus, Sohrensia, Troicocereus, and Camicereus. All of those are so closely related that they will easily hybridize. And because of that, some people have put them all into a single genus. And because Echinopsis was the first of those genus to be named, or those genera to be named, they all ended up in Echinopsis itself. Some collectors don't agree with that, and they'll keep using these other names, which is quite satisfactory. But that just means that you may, if you're looking for a particular Libivia, you may have to look in a catalog under Echinopsis for it. So most of the Echinopsis plants are native to Argentina with a few overlapping into Bolivia, Peru, and Brazil. Problem is some of them are day flowering, they're diurnal. Those were mostly the, the Libivias and the other genera, but not Echinopsis. Most of the Echinopsis, the, the real species, true species are nocturnal. So they flower at night. So this gets a little confusing when we start hybridizing these things because the plant's getting genes that are either day flowering or night flowering or both. Some of these plants are globular, so they're barrel cactus. The Sohrensia is a good example of them. Whilst others are columnar. So the Helianthocereus, the Trichocereus, are columnar plants. Echinopsis themselves are start off globular and end up being short columnar. And Helianthocereus plants have weak, tall stems, so they end up falling over and they become trailing plants. So now when we hybridize these things together, the resulting plants really seem to be confused. They don't know whether to be globular, go upright or fall over and trail along the ground, and whether to flower during the day or during the night. So hybridizing these things can create some weird anomalies with them. Hope everyone's still listening. I'm not hearing a thing. <laughs> now, getting into paramount hybrids. Harry and Hazel Johnson operated Johnson's Cactus Gardens in Paramount, California. This was back in the 1930s. A little bit slightly before my time, but not much. They started hybridizing Echinopsis type and Camisarius genera in 1935. Their first catalog hybrid was an Echinopsis they called Cultivar Los Angeles, and that was released in 1938. In 1951, they released their first Camisarius hybrid called Flame. Someone had a radio playing. <laughs> so they, in 1951... Jasper, Jasper, please mute your microphone. <laughs> Are we okay to continue? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. yeah. In 1951, the Johnsons came up with their first Camisarius hybrid, which was called Flame. And then they moved to Paramount and started using the Paramount name for all of their Echinopsis hybrids. That was in 1951. 
between 1954 and 1968, they released 26 Paramounts and six Camiserius hybrid cultivars. After moving their nursery to Fallbrook, they renamed it Cacti Landia Gardens. And in Fallbrook, they released nine more plants, which they still call Paramounts, and a Camiserius Mephisto. Now, if you're interested in looking into these further and seeing a few pictures, there's not many pictures around of these things. So Larry Mittick, um, had articles in the CSSA Journal, volume 61, which was 1989 journal. And there was in two different ones, pages 33 to 40 and 62 to 67. Now these journals are in our library and they are on USB sticks. So if you want to see them, you can borrow the USB stick from the library and you'll have the whole supply of journals to go through. Now, Paramount cultivars were later used for further hybridization by Mark Dimmitt and Bob Schick, and photos of their plants are in the CSSA journals, volume 68 and 69. So that would be what? Seven years later from 61, so that would be 1996. Uh, yeah, 1996 journals and 1997. Dave, I have a question. Yeah. If like it took like a few years to create new hybrid or to get new hybrid or cultivar, uh, after that, if they release it as a, as a cultivar, they start propagating it by cuttings, by offsets only, or how did they do it? Sorry, I'm, I'm having trouble getting the question. Well. You said that you cannot propagate cultivar by seeds, okay? Right, right, yeah. Yes, how did they propagate them? Just by cuttings or offsets? Just, just by cuttings, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I'll get a bit more into this, I hope, I think. So, um, I also got into this. So that's why at the bottom there I say, and Dave Naylor. So I was later using Paramounts for further hybridization. So let's look at the characteristics of Paramounts. Echinopsis plants are usually very prolific with lots of offsets, but for a commercial enterprise selling these things, it's a detriment. So Harry didn't want his plants to be propagated by other people. So Harry Johnson only selected really offsetting clones for his cultivars. So anything that Harry had, even if it came up with fantastic flowers, if it created lots of offsets, he threw them away or discarded them, okay? He made sure no one was going to get them because he wouldn't be able to sell his. So Harry made sure that uh, the Paramount, true Paramounts, the ones he was selling, barely offset or very rarely offset. So if you have what you believe is a Paramount hybrid and it has lots of offsets, it's probably not a paramount. Now, in a similar vein, Harry didn't want spiny plants. He didn't like spiny plants. He started out growing other succulents. And then it was only later that he got into cacti. So he did not like spines on his plants. So he only selected clones for his paramounts that had short or no spines. So most true paramounts have very short spines or no spines and very few or very seldom offset. They will offset, but very seldom if they're left to their own devices. 
Now, because paramounts are hybrids between diurnal and nocturnal flowering plants, they're, they're confused, but most of them usually start to open their flowers at dusk and they close during the afternoon of the following day. So if you don't check at nighttime, you may be missing some of the flowers that are open and then you'll see them the next morning and they'll close in the afternoon and you'll think, gee, they didn't last long, but they will last about one day. So this is a natural species of Echinopsis. So this is Echinopsis irisii, and it's a typical nocturnal Echinopsis plant. It has a fair number of offsets, and it has a perfume to attract moths because nighttime flowering plants are pollinated mostly by moths, and they have a musty perfume to attract them. The plants, not the moths. Uh, this is a Helianthocereus type plant in habitat. Northern Argentina, this is Echinopsis horatia, or if you prefer, we'll call it Helianthocereus horatia. As you can see, it's quite a sprawling plant, offsets fairly readily, quite longish spines and nice red diurnal flowers. So this is flowering during the daytime. But that's one of the plants used for the permanent hybrids Harry Johnson used to create them. This is another one, this is a Sorrentia. This is a plant I grew from seed, and in this picture, it's about eight inches across, and it's a, it's a barrel cactus. And this is Sorrentia bruchii, or Echinopsis bruchii. The flowers can be diff slightly different color to this. But these are all the plants that went into, to, uh, or all the genera that went into Paramount. This is the Libivia. So this is a plant, one of many nice ones that Dalibor grows. And this is a Echinopsis bacabergii, or if you want to call it a Libivia, it's Libivia wrightiana. So those are the main genera that went into creating paramounts. Now, this is a true paramount hybrid. So this is Harry Johnson's orange paramount, he called it. As you can see, the spines are very short and this plant seldom offsets. Uh, I was lucky enough to get one of these plants and uh, I think in its lifetime, it only had one offset. Hey, if, uh, I have this plant from you, I believe. Not and this one. Maybe not this one, but it's, it's the same. Like it's a paramount orange. Oh, OK. Uh, then this is and, it. Uh, then. I'm, because you gave it to me like about two, three years ago. Yeah. And, okay. uh, and, and, uh, and only this summer, I've got four offsets. Oh, OK. So OK, good. Good. Yeah. Good. It's not, I mean, it's not disappearing. It's still living there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's great. I, th I wasn't sure. I hadn't checked my, uh, my database to see what happened to, to all these plants. No. Because I've, I've got rid of most of them. I have very few left. I only have about 50 left. And I'm not sure if I have any of the true paramounts remaining. No, oh, but you gave me one for sure. Yeah. Well, that's good. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Now, one thing I didn't mention, and I should have mentioned it earlier, was uh, the vegetative propagation. I've said that Harry Johnson did not 
select plants that offset freely. So you may wonder, okay, so how did Harry get his plants to sell them? Well, because what he did was cut the top off the plants. So by cutting off the growing point, you force the plant to offset. And then Harry would use these offsets, plant them, cut their tops off. So he got even more offsets and just kept it going. So by chopping up your choice plant, you can create more, but it takes guts to chop it up. <laughs> of course, you can also graft individual aerials. So if you want to get into grafting, you can cut the top off and the piece you cut off, you can take the aerials and graft them on different stock and you'll each one will form another plant. But the point is the propagation must be vegetative. You have to use a part of the vegetable, the plant itself, rather than a seed. Hey Dave, when, yeah. when, he, when he cut the tops off, how aggressive would a paramount offset then? Is it, is it still quite slow or does it become uh, very rampant, the offsetting? Well, until it has growing points, it would be quite rampant because it's got all of its growing juices right, coming up inside the plant through the, uh, through the system and it's just gonna have to go somewhere. So it's gonna send all kinds of offsets out, possibly every second or third rib would grow an offset. Now, once those offsets are growing, they're using up that nutrient, so then it wouldn't offset any more or any more often than uh, than an original plant right okay got it so that's why then he would take those offsets root them and cut their tops off so he would create cause this to happen over and over again got it but it's a long time consuming process so when i got into hybridizing these it's bad enough waiting say about five years to find out if you've got any worthwhile flowers. Otherwise you don't know whether to keep the plants or throw them in the garbage anyhow. Like I was growing thousands of seeds. So I'm waiting for all those to flower to know if I've got anything worthwhile. And that takes so long. Like I've, I spent, well, from 1970s, I spent up until a few years ago, I was doing this. So it's, it's really time consuming, but it's fun. Now, this is another true Paramount hybrid. This is the one Harry called Red Paramount. Now, this was as red as Harry could get. So there's still quite a lot of orange in it, but there are traces of red around the periphery of the, of the petals. But this is Harry's red paramount. And this plant I got from the Montreal Botanical Gardens. I didn't steal it. <laughs> I was given it, I was working there and they, they let me have a, an offset that was on their plant. This one, there's some disagreement about. This is Harry Johnson's Mary Patricia. But if you look up any of these online, you'll find there are, you look up Mary Patricia, you'll find dozens of different looking plants, different flowers. Now this is supposedly the true Mary Patricia. But one of the problems with the paramounts is that Harry was selling these before there were color catalogs. So Harry's catalogs were black and white pictures and didn't do the plants justice. And since then, there aren't good pictures as reference of what which is which. So I've received supposed paramount hybrids from many people around the world and I've had like five different plants, all with the same cultivar name, and they're all different flowers. 
So this is the problem. There's so much confusion and no one is absolutely sure which is which. But this is supposed to be Mary Patricia and uh, the experts in the States have, have discussed this. There was a paramount robin. If you know what a round robin is, it's, where, it's a discussion group and it's specific. There's one specific to paramount hybrids. And this picture went around in, in that robin. And most people agreed this was the true Mary Patricia. Again, if you can see the plant back there, they're very short spines and the plants look pretty much the same as other paramounts. They all look basically the same short spines and not a lot of offsets. This one is supposed to be a paramount hybrid. It has all the characteristics, but I haven't been able to name it. So this is one I got in 1977. If you look on the side there, it says DCN, which is me. And then this is when I obtained the plant or started it from seed. In this case, this was a plant I obtained and I received, I got this plant in 1977, March of 1977. And it was the 56th plant I got that month. So my numbers are the year and month I obtained them and a number given to the plant for that month. And you know, all of my plants were numbered this way. I did not, well, a lie. I gave two plants cultivar names. Other than that, all they have are my collection numbers. This is another one that uh, people argue over. Some people say this is one called Sunset, but this is a paramount hybrid, but no one can agree on what it is. I don't believe it is Sunset, even though that's what uh, I received as, I don't think it is that. But it, again, it, it appears to be a paramount. Do you even still have that one? Yes. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I have so many other pictures of this. And this one does have offsets. You can see there's one on the, on the plant there on, in where it's in the crate on the right. There's a, an offset high up on the shoulder. I noticed that right away. <laughs> you had your eyes on it, right? I do. <laughs> well, if anyone wants any, high, any uh, offsets, <laughs> they know where they can get some. So this one, again, though, I can't really give it a name, but it's, it is a beautiful plant. This one is Harry's favorite yellow one. And this one offsets reasonably well, but not, not profusely, but it does have offsets. I think in that picture, you can see there's about five offsets on it, or maybe six. But this is called 49er. I don't know why Harry called it 49er, whether it had something to do with the 49th parallel or if uh, he introduced it in 1949. I've, uh, looked at, I've looked into this one a bit because you gave me an offset of this one. And yeah. the 49er apparently is some reference to the gold rush. Oh, okay. Okay, the, that makes sense. A 1849 golden, or something? A golden flower. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, so this is Harry's only yellow one, 49er. Dave, I've, I've got a question. Yeah. Regarding the, the, the yellow color, how, how does Harry get the color he wants. For example, if he wants he, yellow, does he sprinkle Echinopsis aria into the gene pool? Is that how he gets his color? Yeah, he, he never said what he used for his uh, parents. He never mentioned it, but with hybridizing them, it, you do get throwbacks 
but usually you can tell. So for this, he probably used a white and a, even a white and an orange, you know, a white one to lighten the flower up from the orange, or he might have used it some some other yellow. It's hard to tell, but he could have used Libivia aurea, the yellow Libivia. I really don't know. Now, if you okay. want to go into back crossing, you can find it out, but that might take a lifetime. <laughs> you can only do back crossing, which will find out what it's what the genes are made up of. Or you can give it a DNA test, but I don't think there's much DNA been uh, coded or in databases that you could compare it to. So this is Harry's favorite white one. It's a beautiful plant, has a huge flower. This flower is about what, five, five inches across? Mm, four to five inches, I would say. It's a, it's a real beauty. And Harry called this one white night. But it does flower during the day. That's why there's a K in front of that. Okay, and then the last paramount is this one. This is called Barber Pole. And I like this one so much. This is the one I decided to use for most of my hybridization. I really like the striping in the flowers. The only thing I didn't like was the narrow petals. Sometimes narrow petals are nice, but a broader petal, petal is to me nicer. But of course they all have their, their uh, good and bad features. Not that there's any bad features in this one, but this is Barber Pole. And it's one of the la last ones that Harry did. I won't tell you where I got it. But this one I've used for, it's almost all of my hybrids have this in their genes. So it could be a parent, it could be a grandparent, it could be a great grandparent, but it's, its genes are in most of mine. So on that note, we'll start looking at some of my hybrids and you should see how this striping has shown up in most of mine. Oops, long way. So this is this is one of mine. So it's it's got broader petals, and I really like these the flower on this one. I can't say too much about it, but that flower I I really like. I have a bunch of offsets of this, of yeah, this plant, yeah. Dave. Like, if you remember, this is exactly what you mentioned, because, uh, uh, like, you kept the head of that plant, and yeah. uh, I have the rest of it with the roots, and now it's created a lot of offsets, and the offsets are flowering. Yeah. So, uh, I, like, well, last good. time I had a huge bouquet of flowers. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. This is the main thing, is keeping these things in cultivation. Yeah. And one thing, unlike Harry, I did not limit my what I kept to plants that were, were seldom offsetting. So the ones I created do, do offset. Not, not as freely as some Echinopsis, but they certainly do offset. So I didn't try to prevent that. And these, most of these just have my, uh, my number. So this is one I planted the seed in 2003, May. There's another one from the same seed batch. So you see it's a darker flower, a narrower petal. So this is more like the, uh, the barber pole. 
the sound of a barber pole. In that respect, but of course, much darker and a lot more color in it. This one, I have so many that came up looking like this that uh, I didn't even bother giving having a number for this slide because I don't know which, which one it is. I've got lots of these, all with different numbers. Now, this is a different batch. This did not have barber pole in it. This is back in from 1991. And you'll see I planted the seed in January. I used to do most of my seed sowing in January. You get Christmas out of the way and I'd be planting seeds in the, and putting them under basement lights. So that's a dead giveaway. When you see January there, you know I didn't get a plant in the mail. So it, it almost had to be from seed. But I like this one. It's a, a really nice orange with that yellow throat. Again, practically no spines or very short spines. So it kept that trait. But of course, as you can see, it does offset. That's another one from the same batch of seed. Okay, if we go back to that one, yeah, that's, I gave that one number 221. And this one 203, so that, that is the same batch. But they don't have to be like that. From that same batch of seed came the next one. Okay, that same batch, 1991, January. These were all from a single fruit. So they have the same parents. And that's the sort of range of variation you can get when you've got genes from multiple plants in the parentage. This one was interesting. It uh, has pointed, quite pointy petals, narrow pointed petals. As you can see, this plant's laying down. And the next picture will give you a better idea of just how much it's laying down. Oh. <laughs> That's why they're, they're in crates. <laughs> Those crates are still outside <laughs> in the rain and I have to carry them in and put them in the basement. But I've got to get them under my porch first so, they do, so the plants dry out. I don't wanna put them in the basement where they'll be in the dark if they're still wet. So I have to put, I lift these crates onto my front porch and leave them there for a, hopefully a month if they don't freeze. And then I'll put them down the basement. Dave, are these pictures from this summer? Yes. Wow. Yeah. That's my porch out the, or oh, my gazebo out the back. And does this one flower before it starts crawling along the ground? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this one, this one's been flowering for, well, since at least 2000. So it's been flowering for over 20 years. And how long it usually takes to like to get the flower? Because I'm sowing a bunch of seeds from your hybrids now, and they're like about an inch across or three quarters of an inch. And I'm just wondering when I can expect them to start flowering. Yeah, well, it, it varies so much between them again, because they're all mixed genes, you never know when they're going to start. But I usually found about five years, okay. but I didn't grow them. I, I grew them hard. I didn't really force them along. So if you push them along with fertilizer and that uh, and keep them going, uh, probably can do much less than that. 
I mean, like normally Hanopsis is they can start flowering like a, when they're an inch across, like two years old. What about Paramount hybrids? Any specifics about them, or it's just normal? Yeah, just the, it, as I said, depends so much, and I I never kept records on it like that, okay. so I'm not too sure. But this this one obviously is a real a real treat, except it looks ugly. <laughs> you have to keep cutting the top off and rerouting it to keep it looking nice. But as you can see in that picture, there's at least one offset there. And if I showed you the whole tray, I don't have a picture of it, but this plant is sprawling all over. That tray is almost filled. And that's the narrow part of the tray you're seeing there. So this plant reaches the other end of that, that crate. I'm calling it a tray, I meant crate. But this plant reaches the other end of that crate and there must be at least 20 offsets. This is also the same plant I had that had lots of variegation on it. But I've cut off all the variegated pieces and given them away to different people. So. I don't believe there's any variegation left. But that's one of the things also with, when you're hybridizing. Because you're hybridizing different plants, you do tend to get a lot of variegation. So I quite often had plants that were totally yellow and others that were striped yellow and green with the variegation. Because if they're totally yellow, you have to graft them because there's no chlorophyll. So you have to graft them to keep them alive once you cut them off the parent plant. And is there a particular reason why when you hybridize them that that uh, becomes variegated frequently? I, I have no idea. I've never seen anything written about it, but I know from what I've done that when you're doing hybridizing, you've got a huge chance of getting variegation, variegated plants. Because genes are not stable anymore when you start hybridizing them. Yeah. So genes are mutating so yeah. much, much in like bigger rates than normal plants. Yeah. And the same thing applies. This is uh, with uh, cristates and monstros. Like, if you don't grow plants from seed, you're losing out the, on the chance of getting cristates and monstros of your own. You grow a batch of seedlings and you can have one or more cristates or monstros plants show up in that batch of seed. So I was growing like hundreds and thousands of seeds. And uh, quite often I would end up with, with some interesting freaks. And that's before I looked in the mirror. This is my idea of an orange one, but maybe it's a little too, too uh, rosy. <laughs> But I like this one. This is this is my orange plant. There's another one with the pointy petals, but not as much striping. You can see most of them have a medium stripe of a orangish color. This is a nice pinky one with the yellow center. No offsets, Dave? Uh, I think I think there looks like there's one there at the bottom of the picture. Yeah, nice plant. I think. I could go outside and check, but <laughs> I won't <laughs> take the time right now. Yeah. And there's another more orangey orange with a quite a yellow center. This is more of a golden color in the center, but actually I'm looking at the same picture on my two monitors. One has it shown even more pinky than the other. So my two monitors are set slightly different. 
But this is a fairly small plant and you can see it's got quite a few off, uh, flowers coming. There's one at the top over the label going almost ready to open and another three showing there. You'll have to excuse my uh, sad looking lawn. All I seem to have in it is, is clover. <laughs> but there is a plant under that, an Echinopsis plant. That's, that's one of my favorites, this one. The plant looks like all of the others. But that was taken, this, this, this picture was taken this summer. As was this one. Ethan, if it says 1991, is it the original plant or it's already uh, a little oh, off no, set? Or? This, is, this is not the 1991 plant. This would be maybe a top cutting or maybe because the plants were so ugly when I, before I moved, I cut a lot of them up and let them grow offsets. Then I root, rooted the offsets and kept the offsets and threw the plants away. I see, okay, thank you. So I've, I've done a lot to get rid of the huge plants that were sprawling all over the floor of my greenhouse. Like they were everywhere in the greenhouse and uh, they ended up in my, on the compost heap out the back of the house. So I, I made sure I kept a piece of each one though. Other than what I gave away, I gave, as you know, I gave away lots of pieces. Now that's that, yeah, that's the same one. That's the plant looking from the side against the wall of my house. And that was taken immediately after looking down on it. So again, I think that's beautiful flower, but. They just keep going. Now, these are my crates out back. Again, this was a picture taken this summer. So you can see there the, how some of them are sprawling. Dave, what were what were your goals when you were uh, doing all of your crosses? Were you looking for a specific color or pattern, or or what what was your personal goals? Okay, well, I'm very interested in DNA and genetics. In fact, that's what I'm spending all my time at now is testing, doing DNA testing of humans, not plants. But I'm really interested in genetics and what goes on in this. So uh, my main goal here was to see what it was and how I could mix plants up and whether I could tell from what I, what I uh, used as parents, if I could tell what the children would look like. But as we know, the same two parents can have a whole bunch of different looking children. And of course, this proved that to be true. <laughs> so I, from the same parents, these are the mixture of, of children I got. But I was extremely curious in seeing just what I could do with Paramount hybrids, like particularly Paramount hybrids and see if I could come up with more with what went into them. But because I was crossing them with other hybrids, I wasn't really doing back crossing. So I wasn't really finding out what went into the paramounts, if that makes sense. But in this picture, you can see the one at there at the bottom right as a really different looking flower. 
it has these uh, sepals that are red and pointed, and then the inner petals are, are quite different in color. It's an interesting looking plant, but that one does not have any, oh, it does have one offset there. I just realized there is an offset on that. But this is the original tray that these were grown in after I transplanted them, or after Betty transplanted them. I shouldn't take the credit. Betty did all the seed transplanting. And this is, this is in, still in one of the seed flats. So that plant has never been taken out of that tray Oh, since 1995, probably. That's been in that same tray, just sitting there. That's why some of these look so ugly. <laughs> now, this is a picture from my greenhouse before we moved. And that's looking down one of the rows of Echinopsis uh, plants. You can see the white knight there stuck in a pot that's smaller than the plant. Again, that was my negligence in repotting. But you can see the size of that flower considering it's at the far end of that, that uh, bench. You can see how much larger it is than the others. Looks like maybe we're spending way too much time on trying to take care of the plants. Looks like just throwing them in a pot for 25 years is all okay. Yeah, well, they, they did good. Or well, they did, they grew, they flowered. Because the plants are suffering, they tend to flower more freely. That's, at least that's one of the theories I have. That was my excuse for leaving them like this. <laughs> Make them suffer, then they had to flower to, to, to create uh, offspring. It was the threat of death. In that case, mine should be flowering far more than they do. <laughs> and this it's is the last slide. Can I interrupt and say something yeah. here? My experience is that when the flower, the, the plants are really suffering, they are propagating in a, a, a sexual way, which means they create offsets or and things like that. And only when they are really happy, they produce flowers. That's that's at least my observation and my uh, experience with my plants maybe they are suffering way more than yours and that's why <laughs> but uh but i can um uh well yes that's my observation that when they are happy they bloom however when they are not they are producing offsets and it is not only true to cactus or cacti it is like more general observation of mine in general, in the botanic world, it's recognized that when plants are under stress, or for example, they might even be dying, that they do put a lot of final energy into uh, into reproduction. So I think some it's it's true that if they're treated really well, they'll flower, and then sometimes if they're stressed out, they may also flower more. So both cases. Yeah. Yeah. Now, one thing I should mention, like I don't want to give you the wrong impression here, even though these plants are confined in small pots, it's not a lack of nutrient. Every time I watered, I watered with fertilizer. So every watering, they got a, a, a low dose of fertilizer. So they weren't lacking nutrient, they were just lacking space. And of course, in the wild, many plants grow in the cracks of rocks. So they don't have a lot of, normally in the wild, they would may not have a lot of uh, root room. Dave, when you are watering your plants, uh, do you water them from underneath? Because this, the, the pots seem to be so small that there is no really room to water them from the top, do you water them from the from 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 a saucer or something? 
They were all watered from the top. From at, the top. At the peak, I had about 7,000 plants. So there's no way I was watering from the bottom. Okay. So when I was in England, I made a metal tray that I could put water, fill with water, and the plants were in a metal tray that filled my filled the benches. And I used to put water into the metal tray. Once the surface of the, the soil was moist, I would turn a tap on and drain the water out of the trays. But uh, in this greenhouse, I didn't want to go to that sort of extreme. So these were all watered from the top. And if anyone looks at my old plants, they used to have lots of uh, calcium uh, uh, marks on them because it was using well water. So there was lots of calcium in the water. And that does, it did stain the plants and make them look terrible. And that's the last one. So beautiful and ugly, but nice. Yeah. It was all worthwhile and interesting, and I thought it was a lot of fun. <laughs>